Welcome to the E-Commerce Wizards Podcast, where we feature top leaders in e-commerce and business to discuss proven strategies and trends from people in the trenches. Now, let's get started with the show. Guillaume Nussel here. I'm the host. I feature top leaders in business and e-commerce. Today, I have with me Sonal, who's the CEO of WebScale. So Sonal has steered the company through five consecutive years of 100% year-over-year growth, and they're showing no signs of slowing down. So when she is not behind her desk, she's with her family, her husband, Gaurav, their two children, Ryan and Reina, sorry for my French accent on the pronunciation of the names, and their super smart poodle, Bella. So Sonal lives and works in the San Francisco Bay Area and can be found most evening embarking on a long thinking walk or stuck into a good book. Now, the company WebScale is a high-end web hosting provider, expert at managing scalable Magento e-commerce store in the public cloud. As a company, WebScale embraces value like delivering no matter what, take your work seriously, but not yourself, and leave your drama at the door. So just before we jump into all this talk, uh, this episode is brought to you by Mage Montreal. If you want a business, uh, powerful, sorry, if a business wants a powerful e-commerce store that will increase their sales or move uh, piled up dormant inventory to free up cash reserve or to automate business processes to gain efficiency and reduce uh, human processing error or a company, Mage Montreal can do that. We've been helping e-commerce store for over a decade. Here's the catch. We specialize and work only on the Adobe Magento e-commerce platform. We're among only a handful of certified Adobe Magento companies in Canada. We do everything Magento related. If you know someone who needs development, maintenance, training, support, debugging, performance analysis, and enhancement, we got their back. Email our support team, support at magemontreal.com or go visit magemontreal.com, M-A-G-E, montreal.com. All right, Sonal. So, Let's jump into this episode here. And before we talk tech, I believe there's a very interesting story to talk about you, a personal story here, because in many ways, you're living a form of many, what many would call the American dream. Here. You are from an immigrant family. You came to the US and now you have climbed corporate ladder and you've became a CEO of a company. You're not the founder of the company. You became CEO of this company here. So... I think that's a very interesting story I'd like to hear about. Absolutely. And you know, at the outset, I really thank you and Mitch Montreal for inviting us. So thank you so much for, for giving us the opportunity to sit here and, and speak to you about you know, everything e-commerce, everything web scale, and i um, happy to share my personal story in, if it can help in any way and you know, impact others that are, are listening to this conversation because obviously there's a lot of people like me both in the US and in Canada. Um, so let's see, I, I'll try and give you a sort of shortened version of my story because it didn't feel like a climb or, a, or any sort of, you know, stretch or work or, or anything. I think the secret behind most of it is just put your head down and get it done and, and leave your drama at the door and things seem to work themselves out um, for the most part. So yeah, I was born in India, um, close to 50 years ago, I'm 47. Um, came to the US a little bit more than half my life ago. Um, came here... I um, was really fortunate to go, you know, get my master's. Um, I'm actually an architect by education. And I got my master's in, in building science at the University of Southern California. They were phenomenal. They gave me a full scholarship to go there and study. So, so that was my lucky day. And um, right after that, I followed um, Gaurav, who's now my husband, to the Bay Area because he's an engineer and, you know, works in, in the Silicon Valley. Um, followed him here, did not know what the Silicon Valley was about or what it held for me. Um, came here on my first job, um, started working in, in tech and then got a break into my first startup because I was doing websites and, and things for that startup on the side um, along with my day job. And uh, that was the first of four startups that I was a part of. Been a part, you know, part of um, acquisitions of growth. Um, one of the startups I worked at was acquired by Akamai Technologies that, that most of you probably heard of. Um, Again, Ford Startup by WebScale, really fortunate to be supported by just some of the most phenomenal investors in the industry, um, MBV um, and BGV. Um, and really fortunate to be where I am, partnering with Jay Smith, our founder and CTO, and 
you know, definitely the brains of the outfit. Um, so it's a great place to be. It's, it's really fun. WebScale is, you know, is built by our, our team and, and we really enjoy what we do, I would say, for the most part. Um, life is good. Awesome. Thanks for, for sharing. It's, you, you presented in a humble way. It's, it's, that's great. It's nice personal touch there. But it's, it's a beautiful success that you guys are having here. Let, let's talk about some, some customer stories here. Perhaps uh, something you'd like to share, something that happened in the past uh, you could tell us about. Yeah, so look, the customer journey has been great. I think, you know, our biggest strength is customers, once they go to WebScale, they, they find us through their journey for various reasons. So they, they find us through our partner network more than half the time. They, they find us, um, you know, in, in various social media situations or one of our team members reaches out to them and finds that their sites are down or the revenue is impacted in some way and they find us because they have significant pain with the status quo. And the status quo might be that they're they're running and managing their site themselves in the cloud and their pain is is associated with either uptime or cost. Um, it could be that they're they're finding us from you know the lack the the lack of scalability in managed hosting environments. So they might be a, a rack space customer or or something similar. Um, they may find us from a fully hosted platform like even a Magento Cloud because they're they're struggling with support or they're struggling with security or, or scalability or, or what have you. Um, and that's where WebScale shines is we are the final destination for any brand that is serious about scale and security and performance in a very cost efficient, um, better, faster, cheaper manner. And, and that is really what we, we bring to the tech universe is we disrupt everything that they know and understand about how this is done. And we do it in a very... Very simple, very elegant way. We focus on the quality of experience as you work with WebScale. We really value our customer relationships. We value providing them with you know, really high-end 24-7 support. And, and that's what we're about because as you learn in in startups or even in, in software as a service companies, and I shouldn't call us a startup anymore because I think we're well beyond that in terms of size and customer and, and revenue. Um, but you realize that you're only as good as reputation in this space and if you um, if you don't take care of your customers it does impact you as a company um, because they they forget how phenomenal your technology is they only remember you know how they were treated in their last interaction with your team so um, really fortunate we've got seven of the fortune 1000 companies as our customers we've got customers that are b2b b2c um, they may be in you know fashion beauty retail commerce they may be in in cooling and air conditioning systems, they may be in you know food delivery, they may be um, in e-learning or or anybody who is transacting online or doing business on the internet, anybody who's running a web application is is a web scale prospect. Well, congrats on getting on landing seven accounts in the Fortune 100 companies. That that's really great. And from what I'm hearing here, I mean, for a CEO to deliver better, faster, cheaper, that that's quite a challenge. Like, how do you tackle that? Because that's not conventional. Like, conventional wisdom would say, well, you, you can be like better and faster, but you're going to be more expensive, or and so on. So, how do you tackle better, faster, cheaper as a CEO? Yeah. No. Absolutely. So. You know, you realize as, as a technology company in the Valley that unless you are truly better, faster, cheaper, if you set out to disrupt multi-billion dollar markets like WebScale, if, if you step back and say, you know, WebScale is a lot more than a hosting company. The reason that we're differentiated is our technology stack and we are software as a service built from the ground up to replace massive markets like call it load balancers or firewalls or scaling engines or CDNs or bot management solutions or image managers, we'd replace the entire stack with a very simple um, software as a service stack. If we don't do it in a better, faster, cheaper way, we do not succeed. Um, if a customer is able to do what we do for them themselves, you know, by getting a couple of DevOps people and buying the separate technology solutions and not really focusing on the final outcome, um, you just don't have a game in town because if you're, and if, if you're just like 5% cheaper and 2% faster, it is not interesting for customers to change from what they already know and understand. And we've come into the market very recently and we're competing against players like Rackspace that have been around for decades and have you know billions of dollars of revenue. Um, you have to be better, faster, cheaper until you're there. We use 
Leo's technology, we've got a phenomenal R&D team, not huge, but really smart. Um, our support team is just exceptional and really care about our customers. Um, our machine learning thought process, our DevOps philosophy, we are, in, in our minds, we're transitioning what is a, a very traditional business into this sort of you know, futuristic world of, you should focus on your outcome as a business. You shouldn't really have to focus on, how am I going to do this? Just go build your business and let us deal with whatever happens behind the scenes. So you're selling them the outcome and you're saying like you're going to replace a whole stack. You don't have to go shop for this and that and a load balancer and a CDN and understand that whole thing. Yeah. We're going to take care of uh, your whole web architecture and the scalability of it and you don't have to think about anything. And exactly. we're just going to deliver on that. And I can see it in your poster in your background here. Failure yeah. is not an option. I mean, this, that's the only thing in a white room with a big black board there. Failure is not an option. So it shows the mindset. It's a reminder <laughs> every single day. Because, you know, in, in companies, there are rough days. There are problem days. There are challenges. And if you don't have that mindset, you shouldn't be in a, in a young company. Because this is, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's very rewarding, but it is it's hard. <laughs> yes, that's our, uh, well, th that's a bit of a curve ball here, but is there any of those kind of challenge that comes to uh, top of mind that you'd like to, to talk about? Maybe something you're proud that, like, hey, we had this challenge. This is how we, we overcame it. Um, let's see. So I think, you know, in, in my life, it's mostly been about first deciding what that challenge is and then saying, okay, this is what we have to do. And I don't care how we get that, right? Just get it done. Um, and then all of us just put all of our minds and effort behind it. So very early, we realized that our reputation during Black Friday really mattered. Um, because that's when most of our customers, like you start to think on behalf of the customer, you start to focus on their outcomes. Um, you start to realize that, what do they need from me? They need from me a very secure, highly available, fast site that just does not fall down, no matter what their traffic looks like on that particular day. So our level of planning that goes every year into, into Black Friday, and I shouldn't jinx us because we're a few weeks away from it, this yeah. go around and, you know, we have probably 4X the volume on our network that we had last year at the same time. So arguably our network has never been tested to this capacity. Um, and again, I'm not going to jinx us by saying we just got it. There's a lot of planning that goes in behind the scenes into executing this kind of an event. And we've done that, you know, I joined in, in September, I mean, in, sorry, in July, 2015, three months before our first Black Friday. And I remember um, one of our customers had an issue back then. Um, it was not something we did. It was a code related issue on their site. And I remember, you know, not understanding the impact of what it could be. And I remember, being um, in LA with my family, taking Thanksgiving off um, and sitting on at a curb outside a museum while my family was inside and talking to the customer and trying to understand what problems they were dealing with. Like uh, it was an escalation. Um, and I decided from that point on that we were not gonna have these fire drills. We were not gonna stress out, you know, at that moment on Black Friday when the problem was happening, we were gonna prepare so much in advance on every front that Black Friday itself since then has been the most peaceful time in our business. Like it is quiet. Web scale is quiet during Black Friday. And I cannot imagine that's what you find with other brands. There's like, there's a lot of panic in other places for companies that are not on the web scale platform. For us, Black Friday, Cyber Monday is probably the quietest period in, in our business. So, so I, you know, it's just the nature of who we are. So those are the kind of challenges that, that if you think about it again, we're very, very close to it this year and we have yes. no idea what we're dealing with, but um, yeah, oh. we're, we're planning for, for a lot. Congratulations on that and being ready for it. And let's say, what was the impact of like COVID-19 on your industry and the demand on web hosting and some business like suddenly scaling up and so on? You know, COVID has been interesting. Um, so the initial impact of COVID on our business was, of course, you know, we're, we're a very work from office culture. You can tell I'm actually back in the office and, and most of us are. Um, and in a span of 48 hours, we were all told everybody's going to be working from home. So that was really difficult, but I would say the team has stepped up like, like I could not have asked for more. 
Um, and we've done a phenomenal job of supporting our customers without missing a beat. Everybody's been, you know, paying attention to what needs to be done for our customers. Now, in terms of um, business, um, and I kind of hesitate to, to say this, Pion, because it, it feels unfair almost, um, but our business has been just crazy good for the last two or three quarters. We actually started started that journey even, you know, Q4 of last year, Q1 of this year, but Q2, Q3, now Q4 has just been, um, it's been great. Um, we do have a small subset of our customers that are struggling. Yeah. We're trying our best to work with them. We're trying to you know, structure contracts so that it doesn't impact them and they still come into the business with us. We want to be that partner that that understands their pain and, and partners with them through this down because we know that they'll come back, come back stronger. Um, but the customers that are doing well are just doing phenomenally well. So you know, one of our customers, um, Jane Bullion, is um, gold and silver trading online. And their business has been Black Friday since since even before COVID, I would say Jan, Feb onwards, it's been every day is Black Friday. Uh, the volumes are high. I'm sure there are challenges with shipping. I'm sure there are other challenges in their business that I don't see, but uh, business as a whole is doing really well. Um, Agri-Beef, you know, Snake River Farms provides steaks to really fancy restaurants. They're actually shipping direct to consumers at this point and their, their site is doing really well. Um, a lot of our brands are doing really well. They've, They've adapted to change. They've um, they've understood the changes in their market and their customer base and what's important, and what's not. Um, there are some customers that are in the call it the fashion space. You know, no one's wearing makeup and going out and dressing up and stuff like that. So they are they're struggling a little bit. But I'm hoping Black Friday is going to be really good for them. Right. Yeah, COVID really destabilized things. Some people were suddenly out of work, and other people had two, three, four times more work than they, they used to have and cannot keep up. It's a, it's a big shift in resources yeah. worldwide uh, going on there. So uh, you mentioned also your your support team that you seem to be very proud of, and I know you have a very fast SLA that's uh, like faster than industry standard. Perhaps you, you can tell us more about that. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So we started off with um, you know. Everybody was equally important across the board and every ticket was as important as the other. And as we started to scale, we realized that there's something to be said for site down versus I have a challenge right, for a regular support. System. So we split up our, our tickets into our regular support system and our critical tickets. And our critical tickets actually, our SLAs are 15 minutes, but if you see every dashboard internally that we publish, we literally respond to every critical ticket in a minute or two or less than five. We don't exceed five minutes for anything. So we beat our own SLAs by a mile. Wow. Um, the other thing that we do that's really interesting that you know I'm happy to share, so everybody should think of it this way, is earlier we would escalate up. So our concept was, okay, if somebody opens a critical ticket, um, you know, a basic support engineer will look at the ticket and if they can't solve it, they'll escalate it up to their peers and so on. And our, our CTO, Jay, realized that um, that's probably a backwards way of looking at it because when somebody's site is down, they are really upset. And they're upset at the world broadly and, and we are part of that world. Right? So why make them wait to escalate up? Why not get the best person for the job on the ticket right away? So we have our level three engineers now looking at every critical ticket. And if they find that it's, you know, it's a simple thing or it's not, you know, it's some customer that might be overreacting and opening a critical ticket and it's not that critical and it's not a site down issue, we can always escalate down. So we look at it from that point of view of let's get the best person on the job right away and get it fixed. So it's not so much how soon we respond to a critical ticket. It's actually how quickly we can fix it. Because if I respond to a ticket right away, I meet my SLAs. But if I take two days to fix it, there's no point for SLA. Right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. We, they want uh, this, this SLA for time to reply and SLA for time to resolution. Exactly. And, uh, those are very, uh, very important. Um, okay, so that's an interesting okay. structure. So you got probably some kind of project team also to onboard a new client, probably some standard support team, and then yeah. you have the emergency support team. Is yeah. That right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we've. I think we've done a, a pretty great job as we've scaled to break out our provisioning team and our provisioning team only provisions new customers. We've got a pre-sales team that is you know, working with the customer to make sure that they're onboarded correctly. So multiple constituents to speak on behalf of the customer and then to maintain on behalf of the company instead of the same person having to 
you know, a pre-sales engineer onboarding a customer and supporting a customer, that starts to get pretty old pretty quickly. Um, so we've got, you know, pre-sales engineers, we've got provisioning engineers, we've got level three, level two, level one support, then we've got our support management that is not really working actively on tickets, but they're actually managing the process of assignment of tickets and our director is managing dashboards and escalations and so on and so forth. So we, we take it very seriously. We do not we don't hold back on our investments in, in supporting our customers. Yeah, yes, I see, because it, it's the core of your business. Of course, you have the infrastructure that needs to be up all the time and scalable, but then you're a support business. I mean, the whole infrastructure, then that's a lot of staff, uh, level one, two, three, pre-sale, onboarding, and so on. It's, it's a lot of expertise. It's quite a queue just to, to get the final product, you know? Yeah. Lots of people uh, in this. And, and yeah, I'm very interested by uh, how you structure things in your business like this. And let's say, what else are, are you responsible for, like on your day to day as as a CEO? Like, what's your day to day? What what do you work on? What are your responsibilities? Yeah, so so CEOs. I mean, every leadership um, meeting that you sit in, you're you're told that as a CEO, you're responsible for three things. You're responsible for um, the vision of your company, the vision and culture, obviously. A lot of it comes from me. Um, I do a lot of our hiring. So I, I believe I speak to most people that we hire into the business even today. Personally, I'm the last interview. Um, and I care very deeply about you know, who comes in and, and how they impact our culture and why they want to work at that scale. That's really important to me. Um, and then the third piece is you know, financially making sure that the company is secure. So that's technically my three top responsibilities. But when I'm not fundraising or I'm not hiring or you know, I'm not sort of um, setting the vision and culture because you don't change that pretty much every day. Right. It's kind of set and it stays. I'm meddling in sales. I'm meddling in marketing. And, you know, in fact, I think my team is the happiest when I'm fundraising because I leave them all alone to do their job. <laughs> much better than me. Um, right. So, right. yeah, so I kind of, I mean, except for engineering because no one wants to trust me with writing code. I pretty much meddle in, in everything. Okay. Yeah, it's the role of the CEO to oversee the big picture of things going well in every area. It's a, yeah. it can be challenging. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Very lots of varied work, but it can be very challenging also to keep track of all that stuff in your mind and say uh, where where everything is at business wise, uh, business wide also. Um, okay, and let's say uh, you know about that hiring. You're the final interview for people mm -hmm. there, and. We all know how critical it is to get the right people on board in the company. It can be the difference on the market and everything. I believe people come first and then you have processes and then you have tools last, but people come first. Yes. So what are you looking for when you hire a candidate? Like how do you make your, your decisions? You know, that kind of varies in, in all honesty, Graham, across all the various roles. I mean, engineering, I definitely do not do a technical interview for, for any of the engineers that come on board, but I just want to understand from them why are they joining WebScale? Like, what is interesting in our business that calls out to them? Is it that they're they're wanting to transition into cloud technologies and they want to learn you know, new ways of doing things? Um, is it that they're moving from maybe hardware engineering over to software engineering and we are that stepping stone that gets them there? Um, is it that they're moving to one of the locations that we have an R&D center and, and this is the job that they're trying out for? Do they want to work in a startup? Do they want to work in a big company? And just want to make sure that their goals are aligned with our goals because sometimes they may be the best software developer, but they may be joining us for the wrong reason. Or they may not understand who we are. Um, I don't second guess the technical interview because I'm not qualified to do that. But I just try to make sure that their, uh, their needs are aligned with us. And that also, I understand them as they're coming to the business and you know as we're making future decisions, but but I have a broad idea of who these people are and you know, what their families are like, where they're from, what their backgrounds are. And, and I know them as human beings beyond just here as a person. Sales is very different, right? It's, sales is a tough one to, to interview candidates because we, I'm a, I'm a salesperson and we are really good at selling ourselves. And you've got to look through, you know, what's being said and do what's the reality and, and you know, how successful is this person going to be? Because we don't, like, I don't look at a resume and say, oh, this person worked for Rackspace. They're going to be successful here. Maybe they're not. Because maybe they were successful at Rackspace at a time where everybody who was associated with Rackspace was successful. But 
web scale is a is a much harder sales job. So, um, so are you going to be successful here? Because I don't want to hire really top salespeople and and have them come here and fail. It's not interesting. So it's it's different. Yeah, you know, to evaluate the the fit, and I see what you mean is that saying uh, in a tornado, even a turkey can fly. So uh, yeah. maybe they had so many clients just incoming that they're not necessarily that good of a sales rep. Um, okay, so <laughs> that's interesting uh, about sales rep. It's something that we have to hire. Uh, also, it's it's a different type of hire. And the engineer, the programmer is very introverted. The, the sales, it's completely different what you're you're looking for in those people. Can be challenging putting all those things together uh, again uh, from a CEO's point of view, um, and of course your, your business is hosting. So let's talk a bit about that. Like what's what's uh, going on that's interesting, exciting right now about hosting, and like where is this industry going? You know, so hosting is not interesting. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know how to say this more simply, but. We are a hosting company that's not really a hosting company. And I know this sounds like it's going to make people scratch their heads. Um, when I uh, I'm already the- doing it. Please yeah, explain. I know. I, I, I'm <laughs> saying that I'm doing it too, right? So I know we call ourselves a hosting company. And the reason we do that is because our customers are in the market looking for hosting because that's what they used in their past life. So when they went to Rackspace, they wanted to host on a server. They wanted to put their applications. They knew exactly how many visitors their application was going to get. And then two years from then, the server fell down because it was too small. And they bought another server. And they upgraded Mm -hmm. their, their plan or their server CPUs or memory or whatever to serve the next flavor. Right, That was hosting. In today's world, I mean, the whole cloud computing universe has completely changed how we think about consuming resources. So we think of it as more resource allocation. In fact, our founder and CTO's uh, PhD thesis, which is what this company is based off of, is dynamic resource allocation. Um, And so we think of everything as a resource. And on one hand, we have a software as a service stack that provides you with all the software functionality to make your site successful, make it fast, make it secure, make it high performing, um, and make it highly available. It can scale, it can balance across assets, it can protect, it can block, allow, you know, firewall rules and so on and so forth. On the other side, you've got this unlimited um, availability of assets, which is what we call cloud hosting, right? Or cloud resources or cloud instances. So we run our software on the public cloud. The public cloud does not have borders. It does not have limits. What we do really well is we understand the application needs and we bring as much resource as the application requires when it requires it at the right amount of time using automation. So we're not a hosting company, but we look like a hosting company from the outside because our customers are used to buying hosting. And if I go to them and say, I have this you know, dynamic multi-cloud automation platform that allows you for better management of your sites. They're gonna be like, yeah, I'll call you back in about five years. In the meantime, I'm gonna go buy some hosting. So I have to call myself a hosting company for them to recognize me as what I bring to the table for them. They don't have to worry about it anymore. Right. Okay, uh, I, I think I, I get you there. And um, you know, there's that big, wave right now of Magento 1 e-commerce sites with the the end of life of Magento 1 that was in June uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. So like, what do you see there about like extending either the live support of Magento 1 or the transition to Magento 2? Like, what do you see going on there in your business? You know, so you call it a wave, I call it a tsunami. (laughs) I have to say, Guillaume, it has been rough on customers and some of them are our customers that are in M1, some of them are not. I don't, I don't want to do too much of vendor bashing on this call because it's it's unfair and I'm, you know, I see our perspective, but I think it was a very difficult time to put hundreds of thousands of merchants in a very difficult situation um, when they didn't need it. They needed help and support and, and you know, they needed to be treated better. And I think unfortunately, without naming names, these customers were not treated well. And while they were being forced to move off a platform that 
finally, after many years, had stabilized to the point where it met their needs, right? Like one nine is is fairly stable. One one four is fairly stable. There's not like all the problems have been worked out from from those merchants' point of view. And to be forced to move just because there's an artificial deadline was, and then the pandemic didn't help, right? Right, right. right <laughs> I mean, obviously, sure. Adobe didn't see the pandemic and make those plans. They were saying end no. of life for a long time. Yeah, um, many years. But yeah, it was, yeah. it was rough. So we actually, um, we do a lot of work on security for our existing customers. And we knew what we were doing to protect these customers. And the biggest fear is obviously PCI compliance and security. That's the biggest gap, right? It's not functionality. Um, so we quickly put together what we call our N1 support option. And we've got hundreds of thousands of signups. It's, it's been very, very interesting, this journey. And um, it's peace of mind. There are a lot of customers who are like, I don't plan to move platform for another three years. And there are other customers where I just need six months of support for somebody to watch my back. And then I'm going to transition off. So we're working with our partner network, you know, folks like you to say, these are the customers that want to move off. They just need a good partner. Um, in parallel, I think a lot of the agencies are just swamped with a lot of work because, you know, e-commerce has become really mainstream, right? Yes. I think, um, the metrics were showing that we went from 14% of total retail to almost 40% of total retail in just the last six to seven months. And, and that means a lot of business for both you and me. Um, so it's been, yeah. it's been interesting times. We are very committed to M1 support. We got on a call with one of our customers, um, very, very big brand that actually a large public company in the UK. Um, and their, you know, their head of IT reached out to us and said, I want you guys to know that you're doing a better job at supporting Magento and providing patches than Magento did themselves. So maybe you guys should continue to do this because <laughs> we're so happy um, that the patches just work. And, and guess what? The patches are coming from our partner network. It's not like we're writing them because we're not developers, um, but we have partners who are writing patches with us and doing you know, a very, very quick, very fast, very well-managed um, job of it. So. I know it's a really long answer to a very simple question, Guillaume, but I think- No, it's, it's a good answer. It's, it's keep going. It's, um, I mean, it's, so my response to him, um, when, when, when Jeff said this to us, my response back to our sales rep who, who conveyed this message to me, I was like, that is a low bar. Like saying we are better than Magento at delivering patches is such a low bar because I don't think they were ever very good at at doing it in any time. Uh, yeah, before. and they moved on many years ago, like because uh, you know in November 2015 you had the release of Magento 2. So yeah. all the efforts the past several years were on Magento 2. So for sure, and Magento yeah. 1 was just being supported with with security patches. There was yeah. nothing more happening over there. So uh, yeah. 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 Now we're you. gonna watch these customers back for as long as it takes, and then you know we have. A lot of them migrating very successfully to Magento 2. And I think it's a it's a good platform. It's got its initial challenges, but people who are live, I mean, we've got some sites that are just phenomenally fast on, on Magento 2. In fact, I would I would go so far as to say that our deployments of Magento 2 are probably faster and more secure and you know have much less downtime during deployment than anything that Magento can do themselves. But again, um, I committed to you that I wouldn't do too much bashing. So this is not bashing. <laughs> no, no. So you have freedom of speech. Go <laughs> whatever you want. Thank you for your diplomacy. I wanted right. to be fair. But I think we are doing just a great job. Um, we are much smaller than, than Adobe is, obviously. Um, but I think we're doing a great job on behalf of our customers to support this, this industry. And at the end of the day, look, we're on the same side. Right? We all love Magento. Um, yeah. A big part of my customer base is, is Magento, M1, M2, community, enterprise, whatever number you call it, um, and now PWA and um, you know, other yeah. kind of headless deployments. That's who we are. Um, yeah, so we exactly. Are exactly. And, and the, the commerce cloud environment of Magento, well, it's built on, on platform.sh. So when you're competing against that cloud uh, hosted environment here, you, you're competing against platform.sh at this sort of bought by Adobe, not as a company, but as a service here to offer the, the commerce cloud hosting. But regardless if you go like open source or Magento Commerce, it's Magento, it's, which is great. And then it's about where you host it, depending on what's the best fit for, for your business needs and the offer for each uh, competitor on the market for this business. Yeah. Yeah. Cool.
All right. Well, uh, I'm still thinking about your better, faster, cheaper uh, mention, how you set up your company for like a really good support because it's quite an architecture of staff to hire to be a support company versus like a project based company that would churn out projects one after another. It's a very different business bill. And I, like those two builds, uh, because especially let's say web agencies would typically have that. They can be a project building machine or they can be a support. Uh, machine, both is possible, but it's uh, two different business units that are almost like competing for business resources together. It's a very, very different business models. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm still thinking about what you're saying. Is there anything else that uh, we should talk about that uh, I have not brought up yet? Uh... No, I think Gwen, you've, you've done a really great job of, you know, asking us about our business and sharing with us. And I think, you know, happy to share with you as, as a company, I think you outlined earlier that we're growing at 100% um, and we've been exceeding that number pretty consistently um, and I believe next year it's going to be more than 100% we're just our big customers that have started working with us are are getting bigger with us our small customers are growing I think it's a it's a push that we're seeing in the industry and we're we're benefiting from it and I think we benefit from it a little disproportionately because of what a great job we do both on you know focusing on R&D so I think that's the area where we're not taking focus away from R&D. We're planning to, to invest in that area because there's so much work to be done across things like fraud, bots, you know, security. We're, um, we're actually becoming very, we've always been a great security platform, but our focus on security is becoming even deeper using um, machine learning and, and trying to do you know, some, some more incredible things on supporting our customers so that before they have a challenge, we're able to identify what's going on, on their site um, because after they have a challenge or, or a security breach, it's too late. So that's the kind of thinking that's going into to what we're doing. Um, and I expect, you know, next year, same time if we should do this again, my guess is we'll have even more Fortune 1000 customers. We'll have even bigger relationships with a lot of our larger brands and, and we'll have, you know, obviously twice the amount of logos and, and customer success stories that we have already across various platforms. And I think I should mention that, that, we are not only Magento, we support Drupal sites and Ruby on Rails and WordPress, WooCommerce. Um, Jane Bullen arguably is the largest WordPress WooCommerce deployment on the internet. Um, and uh, you know, we, so we've got all of those other platforms. We've got um, Oracle Commerce, we've got SAP Hybrids, we've got um, IBM. We've got a lot of different platforms that we support um, and we support them across all cloud providers. And in every geography, we've got customers in more than 10 countries, even though we're a very US company so far. Um, and that's all happened by you know, um, us finding you know, people like you, believers like you, and, and you know, believers like our customers finding us from countries like Malaysia and you know, other parts of the world. All right. Well, uh, I do believe uh, you'll have the growth you just mentioned, the success. Uh, you, you guys are on, are on track for it. So, well, uh, so now thank you for being here today. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate the, the platform to get our message out. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the e-commerce wizards podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and contact us at magemontreal.com. <laughs>